everyone, on today's episode of Hero Head, we're talking about Resident Evil. Zero. One. Two. Nemesis. Code Veronica. And that's it. Hey everyone, it's October, which means it's time to get spooky, and there is no better way to set the tone and set the mood than to talk about Resident Evil. Thanks to Phantom Pain, I, I can clearly say now that it is definitively my favorite franchise in video games. So today, we are going to talk about Resident Evil Zero, all the way up until Code Veronica, and then next week, the beginning of the end, Resident Evil 4, 5, and 6. Let's get started. Resident Evil Zero, there's this guy named Billy, I don't even know what his deal is, and the game makes absolutely no sense when put in the timeline. Here's where it all begins, Resident Evil. We're talking about original and remake here. Man, if you're not playing Resident Evil 1 on Halloween, you're doing it wrong. What are you, like, this is what you need to be doing on Halloween. Make sure you have it booted up, ready to go. The minute the sun sets behind those buildings, you enter that Spencer Mansion. This game is the pinnacle, the definition of one of my favorite descriptors when talking about video games, intimate. Every single bullet, every single encounter is m the most powerful in the entire franchise. Nothing ever becomes that powerful when you see one lone zombie in the hallway or a dog crashes through a window. Your ammo and your resources are the most limited and there's just a mystery. I have said this in the past, bear with me here, it's a little weird, but growing up, Resident Evil was my Dark Souls. You know, I, I always see that a lot of people dismiss the Resident Evil story, they think it's wacky and convoluted and, and they don't really follow it, but again, I choose to live in my fantasy and I would always just imagine what is happening outside of what's actually on screen at the time. All those documents beautifully placed, beautifully written, filling in the holes. And one of the most memorable environments, when you are in that Spencer Mansion, you are mapping out each room by room in your mind. Everything is interconnected. When you're on the other side of the mansion, you're thinking about just rooms over there. They have a connective tissue that was missed in the later games. If Resident Evil 1 is alien, Resident Evil 2 is aliens. Now, I get asked a lot, what's your favorite? What's your favorite game? I gotta be in a specific mood to watch Alien, and I gotta be in a very specific mood to boot up Resident Evil Halloween coming up. But Resident Evil 2 and Aliens, I can throw that on any time, any day, day or night, sun up, sun down. Resident Evil 2 just has a much brisker pace than Resident Evil 1. It is a constant forward motion. It is a constant propulsion. You are constantly moving, unlocking, fighting. And there's a, there's a sense of urgency in Resident Evil 2 because of the two characters. When you're Leon, you gotta get out, you're communicating with Claire over the radio, you gotta find keys, you gotta get the hell out. You gotta get out of Raccoon City. When you're Claire, you're looking for Chris, you're trying to put the clues together, all hell is broken loose in Raccoon. I get so excited when I'm talking about Resident Evil 2! The environment, the, the, the scenarios, the A and the B scenario, the way these interweave this is, this is insane, okay? You have that prototype nemesis, Mr. X, crashing through the floor as Leon. He's hunting you down. You have some Jack the Ripper shit when Claire goes underground into Chief Iron's torture room. And the best, though, that, 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 the reason it's the best is because of the way it all connects and builds off Resident Evil 1's foundation. Chief Irons was getting bribed by Umbrella, reading his documents, talking to him, putting those story links together. The Mr. X comes through to clean up any civilians or humans 
that are that are capable of spilling the beans on Umbrella, kind of like Nemesis. Which brings us to the often overlooked Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Come on here. Little backstory about this game. It was supposed to just be Resident Evil Nemesis. You know, kind of a side game. Uh, not supposed to be Resident Evil 3. Capcom was like, yo, we gotta sell some copies here. You know, we need these people to, to see that number. We need to see a three on there. So they did. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Your Jill Valentine back in the fight. Now, man, future Resident Evil games, we're gonna get to those later, but talk about low hanging fruit. Why have we not gone back to this scenario? This guy mercilessly hunts you down. There are like choose your own adventure style uh, RPG elements when you encounter him. There's so many things this game did that, that just never returned. It always bums me out. You had uh, ammo powder and you could combine the powders and create all these different kinds of ammos. But if you kept if you didn't combine and you kept just doing regular bullets, regular bullets over and over and over, they would level up into higher powered bullets. When you would kill Nemesis in encounters, he would drop loot. Meaningful loot, not like Destiny. Man, Nemesis is doing this better 20 years ago. It, and it just added new mechanics. The, the quick turn has been a staple in the franchise ever since. It had the dodge, which is a little hard to pull off, but it still had it in there. And the Umbrella team, you, you interact with Umbrella, you see a new side of Umbrella, you gain a relationship with Carlos, and you, you kind of become sympathetic to, to their cause in a way. I know it's not the, you know, Spencer overseers of Umbrella, but you really feel that, the, that they have been used, and Umbrella is just using everyone. And I love that it was Renegade Jill Valentine. You know, Resident Evil 2 had two new characters. Resident Evil 3, you're back in the, the shoes of Jill Valentine again, just connecting that story, wondering where Chris is, you know, seeing what Jill has been up to in this time, trying to get her the hell out, meeting other Umbrella stooges and lackeys, freaking Mikhail, Carlo, seeing that they've been used by Umbrella. Umbrella has their hands in every facet of civilization, just fucking trying world domination. Code of America is a weird game, okay? <laughs> I like, I love the story setup, okay? I love that intro when we go back to Claire Redfield and she's trying to take down Umbrella, okay? I love it! I've been wanting to do that my whole life! From the second I popped in Resident Evil 1 on PlayStation 1, Umbrella was public enemy number one, my most hated enemy. And this game was all about that, trying to dismantle them. They've done enough. They've destroyed entire cities. They've destroyed lives. But then you get to Rockford Island and you meet Steve Burnside, just the Jar Jar Binks of Resident Evil. We used one of my favorite words to describe video games earlier, intimate. Here's one of my least favorite, but I've just got to use it to describe Resident Evil Code Veronica. Pacing issues! Pacing issues, man! This game just starts and stops and starts. You're, you're just fiddling around in, in rooms looking for keys, NTC0394, and the, the villain Alfred Ashford, I mean, uh, and Alexia Ashford, it's just super... I just didn't connect with these characters. The environments in that game always felt forced. The puzzles felt forced. They, they didn't have a, a cohesiveness like Raccoon City, like the Spencer Mansion. I just don't like the island and I don't like Antarctica. They feel very, you know, uh, like right angles, a lot of just corridors and turns. Um, the, the, there's no mystery, too. There's just not a mystery. There's no cool documents. I mean, there's the one where you hear about the guy that got taken out back and decapitated. That's pretty cool. But there was just no story to latch onto other 
Then when Albert Wesker makes his grand entrance. Okay. Now we've been hearing about Albert Wesker in the background of Resident Evil. You know, always just, he's out there. He's out there somewhere. He's plotting. Well, he shows up all T-virused up, all G-virused up. He's got virus in him. He's got glowing red eyes. And in his time, it's personal. Coming after the red fields. Now, what I love about this is that it sets up Resident Evil 4. If you go through and you look at all the Resident Evils, what is Albert Wesker doing this whole time? He's collecting the viruses. The T-virus, the G-virus, the Code Veronica virus. He's getting all the viruses to unleash Ouroboros. And it just really sets the stage for, for Chris Redfield versus Albert Wesker, which we are going to get into next week. Resident Evil, my favorite franchise of all time. It just gets me going. It gets my juices flowing. I love it so much. I love fixed camera angles. I'm waiting for them to make some weird spin-off on something. Give me a, a side game or something with fixed camera angles. I just want them back. I want to walk like a tank, like everyone says. Just give me that. Give me the mystery. Give me those, those intimate environments and, and encounters. Uh, but next week, we're going to be talking about Resident Evil 4, 5, and 6, wrapping up this saga. Last week, we talked about another one of my favorites, the Uncharted franchise. We got a lot of good comments. Pulled some from GameTrailers.com and YouTube. Didn't forget about you this time. Learning, getting there, you know. First up, tongue surgery, okay. Always the great questions on GT Live. Phenomenal. It's a little long, I'm sorry. Sorry, Huber, but I don't really share the hype this week. The Uncharted series just feels so safe. They are very traditional games, linear level design, cutscenes, and high production value. I think they missed a great opportunity to have a Dark Souls-esque way of discovering lore about these ancient civilizations, at least for those who want it. I like the puzzles in the first game, but then they all but removed them in the second entry. Not true. I only remember one or two puzzles being in the second game. I never played the third one, and I probably won't because of blatantly copying the movie The Last Crusade by flashing back to a younger protagonist. I feel like the Uncharted games are masterpieces because they have mass appeal, and not that they have mass appeal because they are masterpieces. You know what I mean? Okay. My whole video game philosophy, tongue surgery, this is what it's all about. This is why I swim in sevens. Because you have this scale, okay? You have the Dark Souls, the Personas, the so hardcore EVE Online nuts games. These are so intense. Then over here, you know, you know, in the middle, you got like Mario, nice and easy, cool. You got, you got just Uncharted and, and easy games. There is a scale which video games are on. Uncharted is this side of the scale. It is not better or worse than Dark Souls. It is different, and I love it for that. Next up, Jay Blizzy fan just bought the Uncharted collection today. It'll be my first time playing the saga because I had a 360. I'm officially hyped. Yes, there are no wars. It's all about video games. No alliances or allegiances. It's just all about the games. Love that. James Brinsfield, when upper management buckles, Michael Huber chuckles. <laughs> Fran Joff, I don't want to start a flame war, but I never got the love for Uncharted. They were fun, over the top, top action games, but I beat them all in three sittings or less because of the incredibly short length, and after I finished them, I moved on. To me, they were the equivalent of a dumb action movie. Could you explain why you love the franchise to me? I'd like a good discussion on this topic. I tried to explain it in the episode, just fun, Fast-paced, fun characters. I don't need to be in An Orlando or freaking Inaba. I just like being Nathan Drake. He's just an awesome guy. He reminds me of Jackie Chan, just doing crazy stunts, getting hurt all the time, and just going through the jungle with Sully. Dee Dee Slauson, after the sheer amount of amazing, huge open world games this year, I find myself yearning for the satisfying linearity of Uncharted, the familiar lovable characters, and the enjoyable thrill ride. It's pure comfort gaming, yes! Next up, Pote Kupuku. Uh, at the 1 minute 53 mark, 
among thieves? What is dat? Response from TVIP. GT not caring. You know, I'm not the best uh, speller on the SATs. I think I scored like a 16. 16th percentile, which means 85% of people out there are better spellers than me. Just doing our best. That's it. That's the show. We're just getting started with Resident Evil next week. Out of control. Resident Evil 4, freaking masterpiece. Shinji Mikami. Uh, share your thoughts and feelings on the franchise. I'm at Michael P. Huber. Tweet me. Put it in the comments. Your love. What's going on with this series? See you next week. Time for Q. Playing Star Wars Battlefront Beta got me thinking about Star Wars games, so I started thinking about Jedi Outcast 2 from Raven Software. But don't play that game, play their earlier stuff. We're talking about Heretic and Hexen. Using a modified Doom engine, go through fantasy 3D environments as one of three classes. Choose the warrior. You encounter these flaming beasts, balrogs, wizards, all these crazy things. It was a moment in time. It is a legendary game, not a legendary game, but it is a game that should be acknowledged as, as one of the early days of first person gaming.